Thanks for coming. Uh, let me also say that uh, I have to repeat what Dimitar said. Our roads, our paths are somewhat parallel. And let me also say that I'm a big fan of the work done by Dimitar and the group. And it's also very nice to be amongst friends. Um, Walter and I share many of the same interests. So my task today is to try and uh, speak about immunogenetics with a twist. So this is a rough outline of uh, CLL. And uh, at diagnosis, we are having a tumor. The disease can be very unpredictable, and the clinical course can be very heterogeneous. With patients following stable disease with no need for treatment, contrasting others who progress. And when this happens, the tumor but also the host will have changed. And then patients receive treatment and may relapse. And again, the tumor will be different. And the more relapses, the more aggressive the tumor. Now, if you think of the tumor as a kind of an entity within our body, then you could think that there are different subsystems. The tumor is one such subsystem and the tumor microenvironment is another. And thanks to work done by several groups, including your group, the, these bidirectional interactions between the tumor and the tumor microenvironment have come to the fore. I would say that it is clearly pertinent and very relevant to study also these kinds of interaction between the tumor and or the tumor microenvironment with the host. In other words, nobody can convince me that it is the same to have uh, CLL and be otherwise healthy from having a CLL with a similar biological profile and have, for instance, kidney failure. It's not the same disease. And then the external environment, which includes lifestyle, but medication also, is critically important. There are studies in other tumors showing that the way you eat, how much you exercise, or also if you are stressed or not, has a major impact on immune function. And this, nobody can convince me that this cannot influence clinical, the clinical outcome, the biological behavior of this tumor. But let's be pragmatic, and this means that we can presently rely on this. And the disease, as I said, is so unpredictable, so biological risk stratification is, of course, crucial. And there are so many biomarkers that the challenge is what to choose. And one can choose from cell intrinsic aberrations, and by that I mean things that happen within the cell. Ah, the prototype is, of course, genomic aberrations, but one can think of others. And then there are different biomarkers, different, a different kind of biomarkers that relate to the interaction between the cells, the malignant cells, and the microenvironment. Your group has also been critical in that with all the elegant studies on CD38 and CD49D. But, as I said, this discussion is mostly immunogenetic. So I'm highlighting here the somatic hypermutation of the immunoglobulin genes. And when it comes to B cells, it's clear that we are talking about cells that are engaging in uh, communication with the surrounding world. They are public relation guys. And communication, of course, relies on signal transduction. These various signals from soluble molecules, but also from cell-cell contacts, are relayed inside the cell and turned into various decisions for action. But amongst the various receptors on the surface of the B cell, the B cell receptor immunoglobulin is, uh, has attracted lots and lots of interest. 
and this is not really strange because these receptors can be on, on every B cell and they are structurally identical. Whereas this receptor, the B cell receptor immunoglobulin, is really unique. And it is unique because of a really fascinating process whereby we get trillions of different structures from the random assortment of different modules. It's what I call the Lego approach. You have different bags of units that you can combine randomly. These small things, when they combine and when they are joined, they can be joined imprecisely. Think of a child playing with Lego pieces where one leg can be an arm and then you get a different structure. And then also think of the Lego pieces wearing different things. So you have the same thing, and it can be a fire worker, a policeman, or a physician. Okay, this is the decoration. This is somatic hypermutation. And through all these processes, we get with trillions of different antibodies. Please bear this number in mind. And... I'm asking you to bear it in mind because viewed from a different perspective, the mathematical chances that two different B cells, two different B cell clones would carry the same immunoglobulin out of this order. In other words, practically negligible. Now, you can have a normal B cell population where each cell and its progeny would bear a different immunoglobulin, green, black, gray, pink. Then the black cell gets crazy and starts expanding, and there you have a clone. And the black immunoglobulin will be expressed by all members of the clone. This is what happens in CLL. So all CLL cells express the same immunoglobulin. The immunoglobulin is the unique identity for the tumor clone, which, of course, explains very easily why wise people many years ago wisely thought that it could be that by studying the immunoglobulin genes, they could learn many of the secrets of the CLL cells. So the immunoglobulin is there to recognize antigen, and now it is truly and well and undisputedly established that antigen is clearly implicated in CLL ontogeny and evolution. It has not, there are many young people in the audience, it was clearly not so about 20 years ago. Whereas today, everyone will tell you it's antigen experienced. And back at that time, uh, those of us old enough to remember how it was, including Walter, Dimitar, myself. Dimitar was in fact doing amazing studies in New York back at that time. And they were not fully convinced in Nick Kiorazi's group that they are not antigen experienced because some of the work produced in New York, including also work done by Dimitar, ha was not compatible with the idea of naivety. So many of us tried over the years, and today I don't need to convince any of you working on CLL that it is antigen experienced, and that antigen selection plays a role because of this. Because today we know that interfering with signaling through the B cell receptor, either by brotinib or by delalicib, that are inhibiting critical players in the signal transduction pathway, you can have amazing clinical benefit. In other words, if you block the communication with the external world, these cells lose their survival and proliferation advantage. So clearly, B cell signaling means something for them. But as I said, it all started with immunogenetics, and immunogenetics revealed that the repertoire is skewed, 
it was first realized clearly in the late 90s, work by Nick Curazi, again Dimitar was uh, part of this study, and has been conclusively uh, demonstrated since by every subsequent study. Then Frida Stevenson and Nick Curazi in the late 90s showed that the outcome of patients with different somatic hypermutation status is vastly different and for the first time linked clinical outcome with a molecular feature and not a molecular feature as in other hematologic malignancies that is uh, linked with oncogenetics. In other words, aberration of an oncogene, a mutation, an activating mutation or inactivation of a tumor suppressor. Here we were talking the somatic hypermutation status was a molecular feature of every B cell. So part of the physiological maturation of B cell, of a B cell, was linked with prognosis. But perhaps the most striking thing, the most striking argument for selection was the finding of unrelated patients, groups of unrelated patients carrying highly similar if not altogether identical immunoglobulins. This phenomenon was described by Nick again as stereotypy. It's a nice Greek word. It, had bad co it has bad connotations because when we speak about stereotypes in Greek we often mean boring guys. But what I will try to, stereotype by the way, means solid type. Something which is repeated without variation. So if you talk about stereotypes, you often th uh, imply cliché. What I will try to convince you in the remainder of this talk is that stereotypes are anything but boring. But first, let us try to perceive what a stereotype looks like. So this is a group of rearrangements from different cases. They utilize these three genes, 169, D316, J3. And what you see here is the junctions, the VDJ junction, the CDR3s. And what you would expect, according to perceived wisdom, is that the CDR3s would be highly dissimilar. But here, they are strikingly similar with few, very few changes. And very strikingly, again, these junctional residues between V and D, or D and J, that are not germline encoded, but rather added randomly the, through the action of TDT, they are also shared between different patients. The chances the probability of this happening by chance are in the order of, you name it. So this is not serendipity. This implies selection, clearly. Now, there have been many studies about stereotypy. I have the true privilege and honor of coordinating, as Dimitar said in his introduction, uh, this large uh, series. And uh, about four years ago, we published a study of 7,000, more than 7,000 patients, and we reached an amazing result because one in three belonged to a subset with stereotyped receptors. And considering this, our main result is that it is clearly not a chance event. In other words, it means something. And it was really nice for us over the years that studies led by Walter from the Italian collaborative group said exactly the same, exactly the same frequency, exactly the same groups of patients. And it's also very interesting now that we have many more sequences. Uh, in one month it will be 35,000 because we finished the analysis of a truly large batch of new sequences. But let's stick here. It's also interesting that 
the frequency of stereotypy is identical. And now that we have 20,000 patients, some of the big subsets can be truly large. In other words, here we have subset number two. We will say a few more things about it later. And now there are 600 cases having identical immunoglobulins, which means that now we have groups of patients where you can start to address questions like, is immunogenetic similarity reflected in other features of the disease? In other words, does it mean something? Is it only a game of sequences? Or is it a peculiarity that pertains to just the structure of the immunoglobulin? I guess that now that we've already said that inhibiting the immunoglobulin has such a tremendous impact and has such an amazing clinical efficacy, nobody would naively believe that it's only playing with, you know, structures and sequences. It must mean something. And I will start with clinical implications. It's a study that we published two years ago. Uh, more than 8,500 patients from mostly Europe, but also the US. And what you see here in this rather messy Kaplan-Meier plot is the donor model of cytogenetic aberrations. In other words, deletion 17p, 11q, trisomy 12, and deletion 13q. These are, this is the most established scheme for risk stratification in CLL. And we have incorporated the three subsets. Subset number one is the most frequent in unmutated CLL. Subset number four is the most frequent in mutated CLL. And subset number two is the largest overall and the mix of mutated and unmutated CLL, but never unmutated as if no somatic hypermutation. Okay. Now, what you can see here is that subset number four has a clinical course that is superior, more indolent, even when you compare it with the isolated deletion of 13Q that is traditionally perceived as the most, perhaps the most indolent CLL subgroup. In contrast, the other subsets, one and two, are down here together with deletion of 17p. And you could reasonably ask me, could they have lots of deletion 17p or lots of deletion 11q? More of this in a while. But what I showed you before was three subsets of different somatic hypermutation status. What about if you talk about the same somatic hypermutation status? In other words, within the same mutational category, here it's unmutated CLL. Can it be that different subsets have different outcomes? And here I'm showing you a batch of 169 subsets. All these subsets utilize the 169 gene. And despite all being unmutated, there were differences in clinical outcome, at least regarding time to first treatment, which is what we are looking at, because overall survival doesn't mean much. Patients have been treated very differently. So what we are looking for here is time to first treatment, which in many people's view is a really relevant marker, considering that at diagnosis, 85% of patients will not require treatment. So for all of us dealing with patients, knowing what to say to them does make sense about where their disease will progress.
So this is what is happening in unmutated CLL. Let's go to mutated CLL. All express the same gene. They are all mutated. This is what happens with 4 and 16. Beautiful. They live for decades, most of them without ever requiring treatment. Strikingly also for this subset, subset number 4, the median age is around 50 to 52, 53, whereas the median age of patients with CLL overall is 72. The youngest I've ever come across was 27. He was diagnosed in 1991. He is doing greatly after 25 years. He reached at one stage 200 30,000 B cells. It was gradual. And then this also gradually started to drop. Now he is at 32, something like this. Okay. Now, back at that time when we published this paper, uh, the classification paper, arguing that it is a new scheme that could have implications for personalized treatment. This was perhaps wishful thinking. Let's start with subset number two and uh, examine it in more detail. Subset number two is almost 2.5 to 3% of all CLL. And when it gets to CLL requiring treatment, it may go up to 8%, 7 to 8%. In simple words, one in 12 patients who will require treatment belong to this subset. Okay. And this subset, as Walter, as Richard Rosenquist, uh, as many other people have shown, is very, very, very aggressive. And I told you a minute ago, can it be that it is very aggressive because it has a a lot of p53 aberrations, for instance. I remind you that the outcome, the curve, is superimposable with that of tp53 aberrant CLL. This is a study that we published last year in blood. Although, as you see here, the frequency of tp53 aberrations in this subset is low. So it's not due to this. So what is due to? When we realized that it is so bad, despite having infrequent TP53 aberrations, we were wondering uh, what to do next. This was 2012. And back at that time, we had learned about the new genes. So the Italian collaborative group uh, pioneered, uh, did pioneering studies showing that Notch1 and SF3B1 and few other genes that had just been discovered by the Barcelona group led by Elias Campo and by the Harvard group led by Kathy Wu, these genes would be prognostically relevant. So what we asked ourselves is, let's take three bad subsets and look for Notch1, SF3B1, and TP53. So we did that. And what I'm showing you here is SF3B1 mutations. Subset number one, 7%. Subset number eight, you will hear a lot more about it in a minute zero, subset number two, 45%. And it was really amazing that the same month, in 2013, Davide, Gianluca, Davide Rossi, Gianluca Gaidano, Walter, Dimitar, they published the results of their independent study. And I think that these graphs are almost mirror images of each other. And I would say that this result is uh, impressive because if you study SF3B1 mutations in a generic 
CLL cohort, the frequency at diagnosis will be about 5%. So taking it together, I think that what we are having here is clearly a distinctive oncogenetic signature for a unique subset. So immunogenetics goes hand in hand with oncogenetics. And what we proposed back then, that it was a consensus, both studies reached the same conclusion and argued for the same thing, that perhaps particular immunoglobulins are linked with particular modes of microenvironmental interactions favoring the selection of particular genetic aberrations. Why? Because they happen to complement the signaling in giving the clone a proliferation advantage. It's yet to be proven, but the fact that we are, now we are doing NGS, both David and uh, uh, Richard Rosenquist and uh, our group, we collaborate in an NGS study, and it seems to be the case because we see, first of all, acquisition of these aberrations over time and also a higher frequency. Now, when we saw that, we thought, can we expand? Can we see what is happening in other subsets? And you will see that there is clearly a subset bias landscape. This is a study that we published in Hematologica two months ago. But look at this thing here. This is a subset that is called subset number eight. As I told you, it's bad. Low TP53, no SF3B1, but you see here a high peak of notch one. Subset number eight is unmutated CLL with high CD38 and high SAP70 and the distinctive genomic landscape. It's IgG which is strange because IgG and then mutated, no somatic class switching and somatic hypermutation, eh, we traditionally consider them going hand in hand, but not always. The other major subset in G-switched CLL is this subset number four. Subset number four, as we said, is very indolent has low CD38, low ZAP70, negative for CD38 and ZAP70, and very low genomic complexity. So what lies beneath? But before we say what lies beneath, we already saw notch one, and let me try to convince you about the distinctive genomic landscape. Ah, sorry, before we do that, a big mistake, again, studies by the Italians, including these guys here, have shown about seven years ago that this group, subset number eight, has the highest risk amongst all CLL for the development of Richter's transformation. Let's get back to the cytogenetic aberrations. And what I'm showing you here is trisomy 12. So again, if you examine a generic CLL cohort, the frequency of trisomy 12 is 12, 15%, and here it's 60. So you have trisomy 12 plus notch one mutations. But is it enough? So what Paolo Ghia and I did together, we, th so we said, or we asked ourselves, can it be that this unique, very interesting receptor that is unmutated and yet G-switched, which in itself is a rarity in CLL, could do something special? So we produced recombinant antibodies from patients in these bad subsets, subset one, subset two, and subset eight, and we tested them first against autoantigens. Black is always subset number eight, 
I think you can draw your conclusions quite easily. And then we also tested them against various microbial epitopes. Similar result. And finally, we also tested them against oxidation-induced neoepitopes. So we selected the three main classes of established antigenic targets for CLL. And again, the result speaks for itself. And we also did challenged primary CLL cells from this subset. And we saw that they responded very strongly. So what uh, we proposed with Paolo is that perhaps what we see in this subset is promiscuous antigen binding reactivity, which combined with the capacity to respond underlies aggressiveness and in particular the extremely high propensity for transformation in this subset. So here is a major subset story linked again to the complex interplay between genomics but also immune signaling. It's IgG as I said and the other IgG is subset number four. Indolent young patients long prolonged stable clinical course. Why? I remind you the graph. So we thought that subset number four is clearly such a prototype for indolent clinical behavior and we wanted to understand why but indolent clinical behavior since these are B cells could perhaps mean that whatever is driving them makes them really indifferent. In other words, they do not care about external triggering. So we asked ourselves, can it be that they are energized? Now, we had to reconcile some other strange features with the hypothesis of energy. And the other strange feature is that the immunoglobulin genes were very diversified by ongoing somatic hypermutation. It's intraclonally diversified, which is not the case for most CLL. This means ongoing antigen interaction. In other words, antigen is relevant in this subset throughout the natural history, and yet it's very stable. So, what can we make out of all this? As many of us have come to understand, and as our host today has elegantly shown over the years, CLL signaling is not only about the B-cell receptor, but is also about other receptors, including the TLRs. And uh, we did a very extensive gene expression profiling study of the tall like receptor pathway from receptors down to uh, adapters, effectors, and other downstream molecules, and we got subset biased profiles. And then, in parallel with this, we did a functional analysis of TLR signaling, and again, we found different patterns of responses in terms of activation, but also apoptosis. So, not all CLL was behaving in the same way, as Demeter was also showing, uh, comparing mutated versus unmutated CLL. Subset number four is very strange. It has a very long, very, very long CDA3 that is enriched for electropositive amino acids. This is a feature, a molecular signature, that we often find in anti-DNA antibodies, so cationic antibodies, associated, for instance, with lupus nephritis. 
So what Stavrula do, do for in the lab did, uh, this is a joint study with Paolo again and that we published uh, this spring in JI. We studied basal phosphorylated ERK levels, that is phosphorylated ERK, high phosphorylated ERK is considered as a marker of B cell energy. And you see what happens in subset 4 compared to subset 8 or non-subset 4, IGH434 mutated CLL. The difference is statistically significant. Then Stavrula challenged the cells with IgG because it's G or IgM when it's IgM and nothing happens, no calcium fluxes in subset number four whereas strong intense response in subset number eight. And then because Tavrula has been studying TLRs for many years and she knew that TLR12 activation is critical for subset four, she challenged, she, she before doing IG cross-linking, she exposed primary cells to pump, so she activated TLR12, and she could get responses. And then she did the gene expression profiling of the unstimulated and the stimulated state, and to her and mine surprise, she found pronounced downregulation of several genes associated with signaling pathways. And then she did a bioinformatics analysis, and to our utter amazement, many of these genes are targets of microRNAs belonging to the 1792 cluster. And then Stavrula did a series of experiments, and she documented in CLL cells interactions of MIR-15 and MIR-17 and 90 19A and B with MAP kinases, in particular MAP kinase 8. So we have a scenario whereby these cells are energized through the BCR, but periodically something delivered through the TLR may induce, may break energy, but there is an autoregulatory circuit coming at play involving these microRNAs, it shuts down activation and then it becomes nice, stable, indolent for decades. So you've already seen BCR signaling, you've already seen TLR signaling, so it's all about antigenic stimulation in one way or another. But what about, ah, sorry, I must say again that these mirrors have appeared as critical and emerged as immunomodulators in studies by your team as well, but also they have appeared as critical uh, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it's not just another set of mirrors. So yes, signaling antigen-dependent signaling. But what about this story? Antigen-independent cell autonomous signaling. And what does it really mean? So Paolo and I, together with Massimo Degano and Nick Chiorazzi, went to Hassan, as Dimitar has also done, and said, OK, let's reappraise it from a truly CLL perspective and see what comes up. And we decided to f start with subset number four. And what came out is that, first of all, there are homotypic B cell interactions. In other words, these immunoglobulins self-associate. Here are two antibodies. They have, these are crystals, actual crystals. And the crystals show identical structures and they show an interaction with a VC hinge. In other words, 
the CDR3 of one antibody recognizes an epitope. It's not at all the epitope reported in UMass paper. It's the VC hinge. And then Massimo Degano in San Rafaele, he did ultracentrifugation. And what he saw is the appearance of a second higher molecular weight species here. And this means dimerization, self-association. And it was strong association. It was difficult to break them apart. OK? And then what also appeared, became evident through this analysis, is that only when you have a G constant region, you have all the residues that you need in order to acquire the epitope. In particular, this lies in here. In other words, is this perhaps an explanation as to why it is G switched? In other words, the acquisition of cell autonomous signaling is a function of class switching here. And then to prove that what we say is correct, we did mutants and we saw no response. And also we used the same system for assessing signaling that Hassan is using. And it's a complicated slide. I'll try to clarify four different cases. Here is what we see without antigen. It's nice response. No response with the mutants in all cases. And to show you that this system has competence for signaling, this is a kappa receptor. So when we uh, do anti-kappa, when we expose the uh, cells to anti-kappa, we see signaling in each and every case. In simple words, the ability to signal without exogenous antigen is here and is lost when you mutate the epitope or the paratope. But we also studied subset number two because it's such an extreme, a different extreme. And it's also very interesting because it has a very short CDA3 and it's lambda. So what came out is that we have a very different epitope this time. So contrary to what Hassan was claiming in the Nature paper, it's not the same epitope. In these two subsets, and we have ongoing results, the study is ongoing and we have results showing that in other subsets, it's different epitopes again. And the beauty here is that the epitope, the interactions, are mediated mainly by the light chain. This was an utter surprise. Okay. And only the light chain gene of this immunoglobulin has the correct crucial residues for endowing the heavy chain in the complete molecule with the ability to function independently of antigen, to signal independently of antigen. Here, the dimeric species was minor, implying weak interactions. And here again, the same story. If you mutate the epitope or the paratope, you see no responses. Conclusions from that. The epitopes are different. They are distinct for these two subsets. Now we have completed the analysis for subset number eight, which is again a different story. The second thing is that you get strong affinities, a longer half-life of association in the indolent ones. And how we do we interpret this? In a traditional concept and frame of energy. When you have persistent, strong binding, the cell is either deleted or energized. 
In contrast, the aggressive subset has weaker short-lived contacts. And finally, this mechanism that Hassan proposed is clearly correct. However, what is different from what he claimed is that there are different variations in different subgroups of the disease. For all of us working in CLL, this does not come as a surprise because we are familiar with how heterogeneous CLL is. Which brings me to this graph again and also brings me to a rather philosophical question that has practical implications. Why compartmentalize? I will try to reply to these philosophical questions drawing your attention to another disease, AML. Nothing to do with CLL. In AML, when you get a lab report telling you that a patient has deletion of 3Q, we know that this patient has to undergo allogeneic transplantation, transplantation. So the treatment is tailored according to the profile. In CLL, this has just started to happen in everyday practice with TP53 aberrations and signaling inhibitors in first line. Is it enough? Is it the end? In my view, clearly not. The frequency of TP53 aberrations at diagnosis is 5 to 8 percent. Here it's 3 percent with no P53 aberrations, yet equally aggressive. Should we care about it? Remains to be proven. The concluding thing. We do not yet know what is the responsible mechanism for the acquisition of particular genomic aberrations and particular immunogenetic subsets of the disease. We have not yet defined truly subset biased biochemical signatures of prognostic and predictive value. In other words, you can say you have this and that and that feature uh, related with signaling. You need to take this drug or you will have this outcome. And critically, we are not sure, far from it, if there are alternate treatments with patients having alternate biological, in particular, all different signaling profiles. This was all. I need to thank many, many people in our consortium, in particular Paolo and Ricard, for their friendship and, he and collaboration over the last 15 years or so. And I have to thank many, many people at the hospital and the institute for their support and for their hard work. And really, I have to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>